Hi, today we are going to be studying for our 391 EC through 6 core certification exam. Uh, there are five sections. Right now, we're going to be starting off with mathematics. So let's start with estimation. Now, estimation is the capability to round and approximate quick mathematical operations. So an example of using this in your everyday life would be the ballpark method, um, which is basically like is the number over five, in that case you would round up, but if it's below five, you would round down. But also remember, you estimate by using what you know or what you see to make a reasonable guess about that amount. So another example is 15 plus 34 is about 50. Now we all know 15 plus 34 is 49, but you can use estimation by saying 15 ends in a 5, so I'm going to bump that up to 20, and then 34 ends in a 4, I'm going to round that down, that goes down to 30, so 20 plus 15 is 50, and it just gives you like a good guess. Rounding may be used to estimate the sum, difference, or product, and it's also used to make mental approximations. So an example of this is if the number is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, you would leave it alone. But if that number is 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9, you would round it up. And all of the digits after that, after you round it up, would all turn to 0. So an estimation is obtained by either rounding up or rounding down. So let's do another example right now, which I see my first digit. I'm going to go to the second one, which is a 3. That is below 5, so we're going to round down that will give us 500. Now for 285, we're gonna look at that eight, that is over five, that will give us 300, and then 57, we're gonna look at that seven, which is also over five, so we would round that up to 60. And now you can do your quick math, 500 plus 300 plus 60 is 860, and that is how you get your answer by estimation. Now rounding is going to be less precise, not as accurate than doing all of the addition, but it is easier to do mentally. Now let's talk about deductive versus inductive reasoning. So inductive reasoning guesses without proof on a topic or a problem. These guesses without proof formulate the mindset that many children follow. An example of how this works would be donuts. If you are a child and you have a donut that you really don't like, it tastes disgusting, it's like stale, then you might automatically assume that, hmm, if that donut was bad, all donuts are bad, I just don't like donuts. And that is obviously not true. It was just one bad experience. But this is also an example of faulty inductive reasoning. Um, so that kind of gives you a mind into, you know, a, a glimpse into how that train of thought works. Now, I did see this um, chart here that was on Indeed. And it kind of shows you inductive reasoning versus deductive reasoning. And we can just go through it. Inductive reasoning, it says, is the act of making generalized conclusions based off of specific scenarios. And it does give you four really good examples, like determining when you should leave for work based on traffic patterns. So if you know it takes you 15 minutes to get to work, but you have to be there, um, you know, like during five o'clock rush, then you might want to leave five or 10 minutes early just to deal with the traffic. That is inductive reasoning. Rolling out a new accounting process based on the way users interact with software. Um, deciding on incentive plans based on an employee survey. And changing a meeting time or format based on the energy levels of the participants. Now, deductive reasoning is a little bit different. It is the act of backing up a generalized statement with specific scenarios. So an example of this would be creating a marketing plan that is effective for a specific audience. Um, designing a floor plan layout of a shop and maximizing sales. Um, let's actually go to the next slide and I'll explain this a little bit better. Um, but first, let's talk about inductive reasoning. So inductive reasoning involves examining particular instances to come to some general assumptions. It is informal and intuitive. And when using this reasoning, students make hypotheses, they extend their thought patterns, they use analogies, and they make reasonable conclusions from examining what appears to be enough evidence. So for deductive reasoning, you are 
when you use this thought process, you're using many premises to draw a conclusion. Now, a premise is an argument or a perspective based on the evidence of reasoning or reasoning. Um, typically, the more premises you have, obviously, the more accurate your conclusion is going to be. So let's do an example of deductive reasoning. So we know deductive reasoning requires you to move from an assumption to a conclusion. Here's an example of how deductive reasoning can be used to solve a geometry problem. So you can see here we have a right triangle. There is a 90 degree right triangle and one of these angles is 30 degrees. So the it says here, the sum of the measures of the three angles of any triangle is 180 degrees. So we know that, let's just say this is K, L, and J. Whoops, K. We know that J, K, and L added together is 180 degrees altogether because that's just a rule, all right triangles are 180 degrees. So if these three numbers all have to add up, that would be 90 plus 30 plus blank equals 180 degrees. Therefore, we would do 120 minus 180, that would give us 60. So we know J is going to be about 60 degrees. And that is how you use deductive reasoning to solve a geometry problem. So let's do a little bit of a train of thought thinking on deductive reasoning. So deductive reasoning, you have your existing theory, then you start to formulate your hypothesis, you start collecting data, then you analyze the data that you have, and then you either like accept, accept or reject your hypothesis. So here is an example when it comes to science. It says all biological life depends on water to exist. Hmm, okay, let's make a hypothesis. All land mammals depend on water to exist. Okay, now we're gonna have to research and collect that data. So now we're going to study all land mammal species to see if they actually do depend on water or if they don't. Then we're gonna analyze that research and here we come up with all land mammal species do actually depend on water, which means we can now go to the last step and we don't reject the hypothesis. It is true. All biological life depends on water to exist. Now let's talk about backwards planning. Now backwards planning is the top quality way to plan before starting a lesson or unit. So think of it, and we have this little picture here. Let me zoom in on it so you can see it. We have our ending over here and our current situation, which is happening right now. So in order to do backwards planning, you're going to start here and work your way back. So these intermediate goals are little activities that you would have your students do. So basically, you're going to like plan your assessments you know, your test, whatever you want at the end goal of your students to learn. And then you come up with interactive activities until, you know. So remember, when you're planning your lesson, finding the finished result of what you want the kids to learn, you're going to do this first, okay? Backward plannings is all about specifications to reach mastery in a topic. Now, here are some key points that should help you during the test. It says, designing activities and projects to support the end goal before beginning the unit. So, before you begin the unit, you should already have your activities and projects that you want planned. Those are these little intermediate goals. You have to consider questions worth asking students to move student involvement in the classroom. You also have to be ready for any issues and troubleshooting scenarios and always have a backup plan ready. Like sometimes the projector isn't going to work, the you know internet could go out, you have to have a backup plan because if you don't have anything and your technology isn't working, then that is just kind of like wasted class time and you definitely don't want that. 
Um, also, closure activities are necessary to check for understanding. So don't forget about informally assessing students and possibly ask meaningful questions related to the lesson. So a little bit more on the backward design process. I tried to simplify it. First, you would identify your desired results. So this is basically what you want the students to know and be able to do. Then you would go to determine assessment evidence. How do I check that they have learned? And you would do your assessments to figure that out. And then lastly, you would plan those learning experiences and instructions, like what learning activities will lead the students to get to the desired results. Okay, now let's talk about assessments. So here are some vocabulary terms you should know. Uh, we are going to go over these individually, so you don't have to study this whole list. Let's start with diagnostic assessment. Now this identifies the student's specific strengths and weaknesses. So diagnostic assessment assi assists teachers to gain understanding of the current situation, to get knowledge on how to improve, and to find the required resources that you need to take action for your class. And you gather all that together from your assessments, you take action, you start teaching, and you will get improved learning outcomes. Um, so informal assessment is a more flexible type of assessment. It occurs whenever is best. So through the eyes of a teacher, you can find moments to assess students. You can base this on you know, their nonverbal cues. Are they looking? Are they nodding? Are they frustrated? Are they understanding it? Um, and you can do this just by observing them. Now, this is the most informal assessment possible, which is why it's called the informal assessment. And think of it like a quick check. A teacher may write a question on the board after a lesson and she'll, she or he might want to see if students can respond correctly before moving on. Next, we're going to talk about the formal assessment. Now, this can happen during or after a unit. It's always planned ahead of time, and there is scoring guidelines based on the type of assessment. So these would include things like quizzes, tests, a writing assignment, even a group project. And these kind of assessments are going to help you answer of what should I teach next? Did the students really grasp the lesson? Should I go back and reiterate some key points? Or are we good as a class in order to move on? And for summative assessment, this is assessing whether students have mastered a learning objective. This is actually going to answer that question of what did my students learn? And there's this really good um, picture here that hopefully explains everything. You know, you have your formative and your summative assessments and you put those together and in the end, you will master all the concepts for your lesson plan. Up next is the Criterion Reference Assessment. This compares student le students' level of achievement to a standard or a criteria. State achievement tests are forms of this assessment. Now, these Criterion Reference Tests compare a student's knowledge and skills against a predetermined standard, essentially a cut score. Um, you know, and in these tests, the performance of other students does not affect a student's score. Now we have the norm reference assessment. Everyone in the class in this assessment is ranked according to their performance. An example of this would be an SAT. So you can see here in the drawing that norm reference test compares students' performance against the performance of their peers. So this girl's grades are gonna be ranked among everyone else's and vice versa for each student. For progress monitoring, these are assessments that continue to reoccur to ensure proper growth toward a specific goal is being met. So basically, this comes in steps. What's the problem? Why is it occurring? What are we going to do about it? And is it working? For the curriculum-based assessment, this measures the progress of a student using materials that are directly from the curriculum. The performance-based assessment is essentially a rubric or a checklist-based assessment. It's a student, 
you know, being able to demonstrate specific skills or knowledge through a completion of a project or assignment. An example of this would be writing an essay, right? You would have a rubric for your essay, you would tell the student what to expect, and they would be graded against that rubric. Um, Performance-based assessment, also PPA for short, is a form of assessment that requires students to perform a task rather than to answer questions that are already made from a list. It can also be known as other terms on the exam like authentic assessment, alternative assessment. Okay, so let's talk about portfolios. So portfolios are when a student possesses an assortment of work examples to show growth and it can show how far they've come along when it comes to mastering a unit. Now, students often have the choice of which assignments they want to include in the portfolio. Now, the assignments chosen are graded against using a rubric that the student has seen, and this brings student choice and an opportunity to do their very best work and to even highlight it, and it's okay if some of that work isn't their best. Um, these are the benefits of student portfolio projects. They include students learn self-respect. They know their mastery level. They can see their own growth through time through the portfolio as it progresses. They can also learn multimedia composition. It gives them a chance to celebrate their learning. It also helps uh, students be able to determine what next steps they should be taking in their lesson. And it can also help students to share their work with the class or even a larger audience. It increases ownership and agency in the assessment process, and students do improve their metacognition. Now, here's the last part, and then you get a break. We're gonna be talking about exit slips. Now, these are essentially short responses designed to be completed at the end of class. So an example of one would be writing a sentence using a new vocabulary word that, you know, we learned. So I would be like, hey, we learned the word right triangle. Can you please use that in a sentence? Um, here's an example of an exit slip. The student would just, you know, write their name right here, Bob or whatever. And then three things you learned in art today. I learned about, you know, lines, shapes and curves. And then they'll list two things they want to learn about and then a question about today's lesson. So it's the three, two, one exit slip strategy. It's great. It's amazing. I highly recommend you try this out and remember it for your exam. All right, guys, you survived and made it past part one of mathematics for the EC through six core exam on the 391. Uh, if you guys want more videos like this, be sure to follow and subscribe for more. Thanks.